This is the Matt Beck Podcast. Today's episode is powered by MinervaBeauty.com. What's up, guys? Welcome to today's podcast. Today, I'm going to focus on some questions I got from Instagram. Uh, Just so you guys know, this episode is also sponsored by Sideline. Sideline is a really cool... um, iPhone app or any phone app, but the the cool thing about Sideline is that it gives you a second phone number um, that you can use for your business. So for instance, I have 845-ASK-FREE. So if you guys want to call that phone number, all you have to do is dial 845-ASK-FREE and you can get a hold of me. You can ask me any questions, leave a message, and I like to use those uh, questions on upcoming podcasts or also on some of the hair videos. So it's a really cool app. It's $10 a month. I think it's like $9.99 per month. Um, And the cool thing about that app is that uh, you only have one phone, but you have two phone numbers. You can turn it on and off so it goes straight to voicemail when you're not uh, in the salon. That way, people are always contacting you. You don't have to have two phone lines, and it's only $9.99. So that's Sideline. Download the app um, on any of the uh, app stores. So to get started with today's podcast, um, I want to go through just a bunch of questions uh, I really like in this kind of Q&A format that we've been doing just because I feel like uh, I can give back to you guys as much as possible. Those of you guys that follow and do ask questions. So I really appreciate that uh, 100%. So I'm just going to start at the top and kind of work my way down and we'll we'll pick from these uh, which ones I think will bring the most value and I'll repost them and all of that so you guys will get to hear your uh, answer to your questions. So the first one is from master of all that is awesome on Instagram. He's actually been um, pretty active on our social media, so I appreciate that. His first question is, is it possible that all haircuts are vertical and horizontal at the same time? Uh, And this is kind of, I think piggybacked off of another question that was, please explain why hairdressers choose to layer with horizontal subsections versus vertical uh, subsections. I know the answer, but I'm surprised at how many people don't. So if we combine those two questions and talk about horizontal and vertical, I think that that would bring a lot of light to people. Um, And I'm going to try to speak uh, visually, if that makes sense, because people that are listening on the podcast, I want to really try to drive this point home, which is anytime you're cutting hair, you're cutting hair vertically and horizontally. You have to think about what's how the haircut is being affected uh, in both of those things. So how do you want to push weight horizontally? And by that, I mean, when you over direct the hair, it's going to push weight the opposite direction, right? If I pull the hair straight out, it's not going to affect um, the, the weight, right? It's going to be nice and even. So think about it this way. If I pull the hair horizontally and I pull it uh, like back from the head, so I pull it towards the back of the head, I'm going to push the weight to the front. That's the horizontal part of it. But then how am I holding the hair and how am I elevating the hair, which is the vertical part of it? And am I layering the hair or am I graduating the hair? And that's kind of the key. So you have to think about those two things when you're cutting hair at the same exact time, because if you don't, then you're only thinking about hair cutting in a one dimensional way. So How do I want to push the weight horizontally? Do I want to push it towards the face? Do I want to push it off of the face? And all you're going to do in that case is pull it away from where you want it to live. And then, or do you want it to fall seamless, right? And just kind of follow the head shape around and then you don't push weight anywhere. So that would be more of a traveling guide across. Um, And then vertically, if the higher you elevate the hair, the higher you, you pull that weight up on the head, the lower you hold the hair, the more weight you build up towards the bottom. So I think that that is the key thing that people need to think about is if I hold up here, I'm layering, but then I'm over directing it back. And when I over direct it back, I'm pushing the weight forward. So I'm doing a layered effect and pushing the weight to the face. Um, If I'm keeping the hair low, I'm doing more of a graduated effect. I'm building the weight lower and then, but still pushing that weight forward. So what do you want to do with the weight is really the key thing in haircutting. 
Where do you pull it to? Where's it going to go? And just try to understand that fully. And I think that that kind of runs into the next question, which was from uh, J Cash, the hair tech, good friend uh, of the sh- of FSE and everything, um, always commenting. So J Cash, you're the man. He's also on a video on FSE on demand. So if you want to see that, uh, check that out. He does some men's cutting, super talented guy. All right, so he says, I need to learn how to cut hair. Now, this guy knows how to cut hair, but he cuts a lot of men's hair. And when you when you first learn cutting uh, men's hair, I, I believe, and um, I cut a lot of men's hair. I've been cutting men's hair since the beginning of my career. Um, but I was never taught when cutting men's hair about all of the things I just talked about, over direction, um, elevation, all of that stuff. I, I was never really taught that. You're just kind of taught to blend um, and put the fade in different areas, right? But it's the same concept. Um, it's really, do you want a low fade? Do you want a high fade? It's, it's those kind of things. So you're still answering the same questions. So for him to say, I need to learn how to cut hair, to me, I know he knows how to cut hair. What I think he's talking about is the things that we just talked about, the vertical, the horizontal. Um, when hair is longer, it's 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 just a different mindset because you're not working with really prominent weight lines. Even though you are, you don't see them as much. So he says, uh, I know what I'm cutting and the reason to know what, what... Okay, here it is. So I need to learn how to cut hair, to know what I am cutting and the reason why. When to elevate, when not to elevate... I have been doing everything, but I think I need to do, I can't read is really the, 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 the fact here. Okay. So basically he's saying that he needs to understand why, um, if you want to understand the why in haircutting, um, it's, it's everything we just talked about. It's understanding every move that you're making and what you need to do is just kind of break it down. Don't jump into it right away and say, all right, I want to um, understand everything. Just learn different aspects. So just focus on the horizontal and the vertical and where you're pushing weight. Focus on that first. Um, And honestly, if I was going to say, what should you focus on first? It would be combing the hair, figuring out how to section the hair, how to part the hair in the right way, then move into um, the actual cutting part, which is, you know, because now you've got combing down. So now you're pulling the hair where you want it to go. And when you cut it, you know where it's going to fall. I think that that's kind of a key thing uh, when learning to cut hair. So uh, Jay, I would say, listen to the last answer that I gave uh, for the other guy and don't, um, don't overthink it, but just take one little thing at a time and really focus on every aspect of the cut. So uh, first things first, you know how to comb hair but really work on tight sectioning. Then you have a clean section. And then when you have that section, break it up. The other thing I think is a good tip is if you, as you're going through a haircut, if you really break that haircut up. So a lot of people section hair, some people don't. I think sectioning hair is is really key because I section the hair with the head shape, right? So I'll go at every curve of the head, the parietal ridge, I section that off down to behind the ear. So that becomes a panel. And then I work on that panel and I know that any hair I'm bringing out from that panel is pretty much consistent uh, with my elevation and angle. So that panel that's right in the temple area, parietal ridge to the to behind the ear, that little square section, I know if I over direct it back to the back of that panel, then it's going to push that weight to the front. So, or if I over direct it to the face, I know it's going to push it off of the face. So I take it section by section and that's how I do my hair cutting. So make sure that would be my advice to you is just really work on, um, taking it section by section and you'll have more success. All right. Do, do, do. Now I do want to get into why subsections, some people cut vertically and some people cut horizontally. Um, and this was Jacob Paquette, I believe is his name on Instagram. He says, please explain why hairdressers choose to layer with horizontal subsections versus vertical. Um, I think after talking to him a little bit, I think he got that question backwards because I think most hairdressers layer vertically, um, with vertical subsections. Uh, and if you don't, I, I don't, it doesn't matter which way you do it, um, And for me, I've always thought about it. It's kind of the the first question answered, right? So 
uh, horizontally and vertically are the same thing in a way. What happens is when people work horizontally, they're working more on the outer perimeter weight, the, the horizontal weight. And when you're working on that, you're not focused on your elevation and how you're, how you're, um, how you're transferring the weight vertically, right? Cause you're holding it horizontally. You're holding a small section. I'm going to make a whole video on this, but, um, but it's really, that's kind of the key. So as I'm working, uh, horizontally, I'm holding more of that horizontal line in my hand and not much of the vertical line. So you want to make sure that I think when you're layering, whether you do it horizontally or vertically, just understand both concepts vertical and horizontal you're going to get the same result if you are focused on both of those at the same time and not just one of them the problem is most people um, that layer horizontally are only focused on that horizontal line that they're cutting and they're not focused on the elevation they're creating uh, in the vertical plane so hopefully that makes sense next one uh hair by Haley m she says, what is your best advice for students struggling to gain confidence? So I did talk about this in a, in a last podcast, but trust me, guys, this is one of the biggest questions that comes up. And I think the reason for it is um, we're not building confidence in our schools um, and, you know, picking people up and showing them the whys. Like the reason that you don't have confidence is because you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. You're just doing it because you're told to. So this is building up, but it all goes back to my first answer, which is understanding what you're doing and why, and then you'll have more confidence. Um, confidence grows with time, but the biggest thing I can say to you guys is you have to be confident uh, when cutting hair and coloring hair and doing somebody's hair. You are uh, working with a human being, and if you don't have confidence, then um, that's going to be the biggest struggle for you. You're going to be fighting through that more than learning. So make sure that you're constantly learning and that's going to bring in your confidence. Watching these kind of videos, uh, watching haircutting videos, watching color videos. The, I think the thing that brought in my the most confidence for me when I was in school is I had one teacher and he. I think he just knew that I was really into learning. Like I wanted to learn new techniques and he brought in this entire box of VHS um, tapes. A VHS is a, a cassette to you young youngins out there um, that held a video, and you would put it in a VCR, and uh, and you could watch it. And I had these; they had these huge collections. So, like, it's funny because uh, I, my career and everything I know is built from multiple different people, um, and. I think you can see it when you watch what I do, but Tony and Guy, so my biggest influences at the beginning were Tony and Guy. Um, I had these VHS um, collections of like six VHS tapes in these huge boxes, uh, which I loved. And Michael O'Rourke was another good one um, that I would watch. So I think that that's like the biggest thing is watching people that are really talented and learning their tricks. And then when you learn those things, um, you, you'll have more confidence because you'll try them. I had, I remember I had my shampoo and set ladies in the chair and I would, um, I'd be practicing these crazy stroking techniques and tease cutting techniques and all of these things, uh, that should not be done on on older women's hair, especially if you're going to try to perm it afterwards because you need lines in the haircut. But I didn't care because I was trying to learn and I didn't even think twice about it. It's not that I didn't care. I didn't think about it. I just wanted to learn the technique. And when you're in school, it's your chance to, to mess up and to learn and to be uncomfortable. So just, you know, work towards that and you'll get your confidence. And if you're out of school and you're still not confident, it's normal. So don't think that you have to be confident right out of school. What you need to do is build your confidence through education. Teach yourself. Focus on what you're doing. Don't just like, so here's another thing I want to say because I, I do hands-on classes quite often now. And um, in when I'm doing a hands-on class, I see tons of people that are there. It's like they spent the money to be there. But then when they're there, they're not fully like trying to understand it they get uncomfortable and then they just start cutting whatever they want 
And that's where I think the the hardest part lies. I think it's if you're somebody that doesn't have confidence, you should go to these classes with questions ready to go and you should um, learn as much as you can and try and put yourself out there and ask questions. Like don't just stay in the back uh, of the classroom and hide in your technique. Like you'll see people um, and I try to pull it out like when I see people doing it, but they're just kind of quiet, um, which is me. Like I'm a quiet person in a, in a lot of scenarios except for, you know, on the internet. But um, I'm a more quiet person, but like, so I don't ask a lot of questions. I just observe and it works for me. But for some people, you need to ask those questions. You really need to, um, when you're in a class, if you don't understand it, stop and ask a question. You're not putting anybody out, especially if you're spending hundreds of dollars on a class. Like you have to ask questions and that will help you grow and it'll help you understand it. All right, let's see. Do, do, do. Breeding Malone. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, why do all the new trending colors fade so fast when following manufacturers' instructions? Example, purples, blues, rose, golds, etc. So um, I don't know if this is a hairdresser question. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's on the on the edge of that. But as a hairdresser, and those of you guys, if you're not a hairdresser and you're listening to this and you're trying to learn things about salon stuff, um, or you are a hairdresser and maybe this just isn't uh, a known fact for you, but a lot of those colors um, are not even semi-permanent. They're, they're uh, fantasy colors. They don't have a developer. They don't process in the hair. So they just sit uh, in the first kind of layer of the hair. They don't go into the cortex of the hair. So that's the reason they fade. They're going to fade. Um, that's why they need to be done often. Um, but that's the great part about them as well is they're easy to get out of the hair for the most part, depending on which ones you use, but they're easier to get out of the hair and you can try something new. Like you don't have to have your hair purple all the time and we don't have to yank it out of there and damage your hair. So, um, that would be my thing. It doesn't go into the hair. It sits on more of the outside of the hair. All right, let's see. Do, do, do. All right. You had a video. All right. I think we talked about that. Um, hair by Umber. What advice do you have for new stylists transitioning from assisting to getting behind the chair full time? So this is a little bit more of a vague question, but my answer would be um, to do hair for, for free would be my straight up answer. For one, um, get models in. And so you don't want to dis. So I don't really believe in the discounting method of just because you're new and you don't have clients to discount people to get them in. Um, I think giving away something first, like doing somebody's hair and winning them over is the best way to get them in your chair forever, right? So get them in, do a great job on their hair, give them the best experience that you can. And then the, the biggest thing out of this whole thing is she has a great experience or he has a great experience. And then you take a picture, a great picture of the work that you spent a lot of time on because you have plenty of time to do it. So this is the thing. When you get out of uh, assisting and you get behind a chair or you get out of school and you're behind the chair, you have nothing but time. And when you have a lot of time, you have a lot more time to be creative and to, to create and learn to take pictures and to mess up and all of these things, right? So if you're just getting out uh, of assisting and you're going behind the chair, do hair for free. Uh, don't discount it. Free looks more expensive. It just looks like you're a nice person and next time it will be the regular price. But you get those models in, you win them over, and now you have a chance to uh, get your work to put up on the internet to get more clients and market yourself that way. So that would be my suggestion there. All right. I am in cosmetology school. I post before and after pictures on Instagram and Facebook, but I am having troubles advertising and getting my name out there. Any tips? This is cause creations 319 on Instagram. I'm in cosmetology school. I post before and after pictures on Instagram. Let's look at her before and afters. Okay, so 
Here's what I'm going to say. So this is, I think, a good lesson. Um, I hate before pictures. And the reason I hate before pictures is because everyone knows that the person doesn't look good before, but it bogs up your Instagram page and you can see, um, you see more terrible than you see good, right? So when somebody looks at your Instagram page and they see a great, um, like great pictures all the way down, they're more apt to be like, wow, this person's super talented. When I look at this page, when I look at your page, I do see good hair in there in, in spots, but I'm seeing a lot of before, especially when you put uh, the before at the beginning and then you have to swipe to see the after. That's like the worst thing you can do because no one swipes over really. I mean, the majority of people, doesn't matter how popular you are on the internet, they do not search into your stuff. Like people are unrealistic with um, the way that they go about what they think people are actually going to do. And the way that you're going to learn what people actually do on the internet is watch yourself do it. So as I go through things, I take a look at this and I'm off it in two seconds. Um, nothing caught my eye really, you know, and not necessarily in your, in your Instagram, but just in general, I'm on somebody's page. Nothing catches my eye. I'm off of it in two seconds. Um, especially if I, all I see is kind of before looking hair, um, and not so good looking hair. So make sure that number one, you're posting the after first, and then you swipe over to see the the before if you want to. Like if you're going to put a before, put it in a swipe over after, um, after the post, because then they see the good hair and then they have to dig to find the bad if they want it. But most people won't do that. They won't swipe. Most people will not go past just a quick flip through. They probably won't even like your photo. They just see it, right? So that's just the reality of the way the internet is now. So that's, uh, that's my answer for that. Um, all right. Do, do, do. Deja Rose says, who inspires you? Um, who inspires me? This is like, this is a question I want to get into, um, maybe a little bit different way of answering this because, um, I try to take inspiration from everything that I see, right? So I'm constantly, uh, paying attention to what people are doing, but at the same time, I'm just kind of pushing forward doing what I do best, which is creating, and I've been educating for a very long time, so um, I listen to your questions, and I try to build content on that. So the first thing would be who inspires you. It would be at this point in my life, the the questions that I get inspire what's going to happen, or sometimes I'm just sitting here, and I'm like, you know, I'd like to create this kind of look like back there we just did a uh, like a shag kind of pixie look um, and that's just stuff that as you're sitting here or you're you know sitting at your house or whatever and something comes to your mind you just kind of take it and try to create with it um, people have inspired me in the past but what I've found is don't get too tied up in people that inspire you because um, it's first off you don't want to just study one person. Uh, one person doesn't have all the answers, that's for sure. And um, you should really, I think learning to just cater to the things that you do best is probably your number one, uh, should be your number one goal, is just figuring out what you're best at and going for that. Don't try to be everything. Um, I like cutting hair. I like coloring hair. Um, I probably more like cutting, but at the same time, um, I do have fun coloring hair and it takes, sometimes I like to take a break from what I really love to doing my secondary. And then that kind of reignites the whole thing. So, um, so from a who inspires you standpoint, uh, the quicker answer would be, um, the people that follow and the people that ask questions and, um, comment because I can really figure out what they're looking for. And that inspires me to do the next thing. All right. Let's see. Okay, this is cool. Cat Collie. Um, I think it's Collie. C O L L E Y. Uh, hey, Matt, how would you suggest a mature age student at beauty school, 34 years old, um, get noticed by salons when positioning fulfillment for apprentices/slash assistants? 
um, from salon owners seem to be favored towards younger age. Um, I understand that it almost always comes down to the wages that the salon owners have to pay their staff and someone under 20 years old is more desirable in that sense. Um, but how do you, we, representing the mature age beauty students here, uh, show salon owners that we are just as committed, focused, and driven uh, to build our careers as hairstylists as our, your younger class. Okay. So if you guys are really figuring out that, yeah, I'm reading ahead and thinking of the answer at the same time. So uh, that's something I need to work on. Um, all right. So mature hairstylist, 34 years old. I'm 35 years old currently for another month. Um, so I'm 35 years old. If I were to go into a salon, I don't think. So here's the thing. I know that um, I've built an audience and all of this stuff on the internet. So I'm confident going into any salon situation that um, I could get hired at that salon. Um, with that being said, I know some of you guys out there are like I didn't, I haven't built um, the same thing maybe. Um, but with that being said, you should be building something um, on the internet. I don't think at this point um, it, salon owners are looking necessarily just for young people. Um, maybe it was a pay thing back in the day. I, like, I don't know. And maybe they wanted younger people to kind of build them up. Um, I definitely think it was a thing, um, when I was working in a salon 10 years ago, um, that maybe older stylists would have a little bit more of an ego or they'd be bringing in uh, clientele. And sometimes that's not the best situation for a salon because when you bring a clientele to a business, sometimes you feel like you have ownership over that, um, but you're going to work for somebody else's business. So I definitely think um, that you have to be just more for, like build yourself on the internet to showcase what you do, right? And um, depending on what you're trying to do from a business standpoint, like if you're just getting out of school and you're a little bit older, um, let's see, to try to get a position at a salon, you know, being 34 years old, you're not really old at all. And um, so what I would suggest is what well, kind of what I said to the other uh, girl about getting out of beauty school. It's not any different. You're just older than her. Maybe. I don't know. I didn't see how old she was, but, um, just start building yourself online, do free hair to build yourself up. If you're still in school, figure out how to get people in there. Um, being a hairdresser is not an easy job. And this is where I think a lot of people get it confused a little bit. They think that, um, you know, you get to a salon, clients just, they come to you. It just takes time. It takes a lot of hard work of really winning people over nonstop one after the other, after the other, and also doing great hair at the same time. So uh, it, you're juggling multiple things. You're dealing with personalities. It's, um, a service business. There's so many aspects that go into this. It's not an easy thing. So, um, I think, if you're getting out of school and you're trying to find a salon job, the first thing I would do is build up a great portfolio on Instagram. Once you build that portfolio on Instagram, then you start tagging the salon in every photo that you post. Find a salon that you really want to work at. And if you want to work there, tag them in everything that you do. Um, and then that's going to get their attention. And once you have their attention, it's going to be a lot easier because they know your work. They know your consistency, because if I'm looking to hire somebody now, um, the only people I would want to hire is people that I see are super hungry for doing hair because I do not want, uh, to be around people that are not, um, driven towards the, the drive, like driven towards building themselves, right? So, um, that's what, those are successful people in this business. People that love doing hair and making people happy and creating a great experience. I love educating. I love teaching. I have a passion for it. I would do it for free. Uh, like, uh, I mean, I get paid to do it now, but I do it for free. You know, I did it for free for a long time, right? We would, like, I would do it for free. 
Would I be behind the chair for free? Probably not. It's just not my personal um, want, which is why I've built a career being able to educate every day and create every day. So think about that, right? Um, you got to think about that when you're when you're deciding on where you want to work, what you want to do. And as a salon owner, when you're hiring people, you need people not because they're young. You need people because they're driven. And it's a lot easier to find a driven, if you see somebody that's 34 years old or 42 years old or whatever it is, and they're posting consistently every single day on the internet, and they're really like into trying new things, that's the person I would hire over a 20 year old any day of the week, because they're a driven person. And it's hard to tell, like you could see a 20 year old doing it uh, right away, but in, you know, in the reality, everybody's driven right out of school. They want to do more and do more, but you find somebody that's a little bit older and they're still doing that at 35 years old, still trying to push the envelope and, and to get better. That's the person that I would want to hire. All right. I'm going to choose one more question here. So Jane, I actually just want to say, so Jane Raven salon on Instagram said, what advice can you give someone who just left a salon and is basically starting from scratch at a different one? Um, Jane, I hope that you listen to this whole podcast and take a lot of the things that we talked about because I would give you the same advice that, uh, that I've been saying. So just want you to know, I tried to answer your question. All right, guys. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Remember, go to Sideline uh, on the App Store. Download it if you're looking to get a second phone line just attached to your phone for your business. You pick your number. Uh, and it's just a really great way, especially with studio rental and all of that. So, uh, hope you guys like that. Um, make sure. So if you want to download sideline, there's a link in the description of anywhere that this video or audio is. So you can click that, click that link. Whoa. So you can click that link and it'll take you right to where you need to go, um, to download that app. But if you guys have any questions, call 845 ask free and you'll get me. Uh, or post them in the comments anywhere that you see them. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast, and uh, I will see you guys on the next one. Thanks.